On my right, uh, your left, is retired Lieutenant General Irv Rocky, a career intelligence officer and academic. His intel assignments included service as a plans officer at NATO headquarters in Brussels, air attaché in London, defense attaché in Moscow, the National Security Agency Associate Director for Support, and the Air Force Assistant Chief of Staff for Intelligence at the Pentagon. And finally, as an academic, he served as a professor of political science here at the Air Force Academy. He chaired the poli-sci departments, and he served as dean of the faculty. He also served as president of National Defense University. And after that distinguished military career, he took a little time off to serve as president of Moravian College in Pennsylvania, and is now back at his first alma mater as senior scholar in the Center for Character and Leadership Development, or CCLD. General Rocky is a native of Warren, Minnesota, and a distinguished graduate of the class of 1962 who holds a PhD from Oxford University. And to my left, your right, is Lieutenant General Chris Miller, an airman whose operational tours included service as a T-38 instructor pilot, a B-1 <coughs> pilot from the time when the B-1 was brand new, command of America's only B-2 bomber wing at Whiteman Air Force Base, and culminated in duty as commander and air coordination director for all Air Force operations in Afghanistan. <coughs> His staff assignments included director of assignments at the Air Force Personnel Center in San Antonio, planner at the NATO Air Staff, Director of Plans, Policy, and Strategy at Northern Command here in Colorado Springs, and Deputy Chief of Staff for Strategic Plans and Programs at the Pentagon, where he led the Air Force's long-range planning and the building of several five-year, $500 billion-plus dollar budgets. After retirement and a brief pause to catch his breath, he is now back with us serving as Executive Director for the Journal of Character and Leadership Integration and a faculty member of the CCLD. General Miller is from and has his own highly mobile Air Force family. He's a distinguished graduate of the class of 1980 and earned a Master's of Philosophy as a Rhodes Scholar at Oxford University. I will be serving as moderator, as I mentioned, and will direct questions to our panel members. As we complete each round of remarks, uh, we'll make the floor available to what I like to label two-handed questions. In other words, if something is really burning and tied to what we were just talking about, put both hands up and I'll call, it, I'll call you out to uh, ask your question. Otherwise, we will leave time at the end of the session for one-handed questions that reference any of the previous rounds or other related topics you'd like our panel to, to address. So now, for the first what I consider a difficult question. In a recent Atlantic Monthly article, author James Fowles points out some interesting statistics comparing the World War II generation to our day. In that era, fully 10% of able-bodied men were in uniform participating in the Second World War effort. Many women joined auxiliary services or went to work in the factories to replace the men who were away at war. Nearly every American family was involved in some way. Society was mobilized and made sacrifices for the war effort. In contrast today, only three quarters of 1% of eligible Americans have served in Iraq or Afghanistan. Americans have not been asked to sacrifice. Most have been affected by a decade plus of war. As a result, Fallows has labeled our society a chicken hawk nation. As a result, Fallows has labeled, or as it's meaning it's, it's really much easier to send our troops into conflict as long as somebody else is doing the fighting. No sacrifices are required by the general public, only by those few who actually serve. Does he have a point? Is our military disconnected from society? Does this disconnectedness make it more likely that our public will support the media-focused crisis of the day and send our troops into battle. We'll ask General Miller to start. <coughs> uh, it, it's a pleasure to be here and, and an honor to, uh, to see some old friends and, uh, and some folks who are joining the profession. Uh, can you hear me okay in the back? All right, please, if, if I start to fade, please let me know. Um, 
I think, like most articles uh, written for a, for a large audience, uh, what James Fallow said is, is more stark than the reality and far less nuanced. Uh, the numbers say personal connection to the military is far less, and, and I don't think you can argue with that. Uh, what is very different in our time is that while individuals may not have relationships with those who serve nearly as often as they, they did in, in the World War II era, the omnipresence of information about what's going on in the military, what the military is doing, uh, is, is probably far greater. And so I, I would say rather than us being disconnected, we may be misconnected because you don't really understand what today's combat environment is like unless you have spent some serious time talking to people who have been there or unless uh, you, you're, you're a very careful student of what's in the mass media. Uh, having said that, I think it is a, a, a trend that we, current and former members of the profession of arms and our partners outside uh, the, the military services need to be concerned about because we're partly victims of our own success if you look at our tactical prowess as a military, uh, all services, uh, special ops all the way through, through uh, people doing deterrence, uh, we're very good at doing the things that we're tasked to do. What Fallows is pointing out in language that I would, I would differ with a little bit is that maybe we're not tasked to do the right things by our civilian leadership at all times. And that's a, that's a two-way relationship. It's a two-way conversation. It's a very complicated conversation. And by being, being a very shiny hammer in the national toolkit, I think sometimes it is easy to reach for, for the mili military instrument of power. Uh, so his point that the disconnection is, is there uh, Admiral Mullen, Chairman Dempsey, many others who serve in uniform have, have pointed that out. And it's something that we all have a responsibility, I think, to address at whatever level we can access, whether that's human to human uh, in an airport, uh, whether it's uh, with your family, with your friends, with your classes, with your companies, uh, with your units, uh, and, and the folks outside the gate when you cadets get out into the real Air Force, you will probably live off an installation and around a community. And I will tell you, it's very easy to get up, go in to work at an ugly early hour, come home at a late hour, and not have meaningful conversations with your, your civilian counterparts. Uh, you got you to gotta avoid that. Because what I found over, over my years in service is that when you engage people, uh, they are almost always interested and they are almost always ignorant of what you do. And, and just a, a little bit of conversation will help you out. But, but the difference is, I guess to sum up uh, my answer to this question, it used to be natural, now it has to be intentional. General Rocky, anything to add? I'll be brief. I'm the old gray-haired guy who represents a generation uh, before uh, General Miller. I remember General Miller as one of our most spectacular students uh, at the Air Force Academy. And again, uh, when, when I was serving in London, uh, General Miller was at Oxford. I watched him continue uh, in that, on that path. I guess I see it a little bit differently. I see it a lot differently from Mr. Fowles. Uh, first of all, I think it's, it's uh, unfair or, or perhaps not legitimate to compare the percentage of the American population today serving in the military with the percentage that was serving during World War II. Uh, I'm not sure what that comparison shows. I see them as being fundamentally different times, fundamentally different challenges, and, and, and so on. I'm also not quite sure what he means by society when he says we're disconnected. Uh, I remember very well what the civil military relationship was like in the Vietnam era, in the post-Vietnam era. And let me tell you, uh, I will take today's situation uh, much, much uh, more comfortably than what I recall <clears throat> from the time when folks like you cadets sitting in here 
<clears throat> were hiding civilian clothes down by the south gate because you didn't want to be in uniform off base with good reason. Uh, some, of, some of you cadets or some of the cadets of those days even bought wigs to hide their short military haircuts. The point I'm trying to make is that it was a very uncomfortable period. That for me was a civil mill challenge uh, in, in dramatic form. I kind of like where we stand now. Uh, you know, the profession of arms is highly regarded one of the most highly regarded professions uh, there, uh, I think that uh, society supports us. Uh, and I feel very comfortable uh, with, that, uh, with that level of support. That's not to say there aren't some difficulties, but I, but I would like to see a more crisp definition of what is meant by society when I'm told we're disconnected uh, from society. Uh, clearly, there have been three excellent books written by uh, the former sec defs, sec secretaries of defense recently, who have pointed out that there are some issues between, uh, between what, what Mr. Fowler describes as the political sector and, uh, and, and the military. Uh, but that political sector I would, not, I would not equate to society at large. I think that's a different problem. And perhaps later in this discussion, we can talk a little bit about that more, uh, that more focused uh, challenge in terms of civil military relations. Thank you. Any two-handed questions out there before we move on? Actually, if, if I could just follow up now on, on your last point. Um, one of the things that, that some of you have seen, uh, many of you will see, at the highest levels of, of government, uh, the process of making decisions in our government results, uh, results from information that is aggregated and compacted and compressed and, and summarized uh, up to very high levels. And I think what may be, uh, to, to General Rocky's point, what we may have had more of in the past is individuals with strong and active relationships across the military civil boundary who could kind of wrap detailed discussion you know uh, around restaurant tables and, and over the phone and, and other ways around that very large decision making process that our, our nation uses to make consequential decisions so that is something that is important that that uh, we have to pay attention to because, because by the time options are presented to the president, they're, they're usually pretty stark. And, and sometimes we lose the subtlety that I think today's environment really needs because it's not about where the line on the ground is. You know, are we going to cross the channel to retake the continent of Europe? The challenges that our civilian leadership faces are very complex. They've always been complex, but they are still complex, and, and our decision-making processes need to be supplemented by people who really understand and can work with each other. So just as a follow-up then, newest surveys indicate about 65% of Americans consider ISIS a threat, and another 57% would favor sending American troops into combat against ISIS, uh, both in Iraq and Syria, of course. Um, do you think our disconnectedness that was mentioned between the politicians and the military um, reflects that? And do vets perhaps fear that they will be sent into yet another conflict in the Middle East? I'll take the first swing at it and then let uh, Chris uh, pile on. I guess my fear is not so much as described in, in in your question. Uh, my fear relates more to uh, the challenge of having a crisp, clear, desired effect before we get involved in a military uh, situation. Uh, I believe that well, it's fundamental to our constitutional system is the notion of civilian control. And, 
and my guess is every one of us in this room uh, are fervent supporters uh, of that notion. But with that comes a responsibility for both the military and the civilian policymakers to play appropriate roles. The role I see for the senior civilian policymakers is to look at the security predicament we find ourselves in and define in, in, oper in, in a fashion that's sufficiently definitive so we can respond in a, uh, as a military, uh, define what the effect is we wish to achieve. What is it we want to happen? The reason, and, and I would uh, say that we perhaps have fallen short uh, in that regard, uh, with regard to, and I'm speaking now of, of, of senior civilian policymakers. When I look at what, for example, the desired effect is in Syria, as we sit in this room, I have a little, I have some difficulty articulating with with clarity what it is the the senior civilian policymakers really want the military to do. So on the one hand, I'm saying we should push to get a, a, uh, a more articulate description of, of those desired effects. On the other hand, I would say that we as a military uh, have to expand the lens through which we look at that predicament to go beyond ships, planes, tanks, and missiles. Uh, as you heard, I was, I was an intelligence officer when I wasn't teaching poli-sci at the Air Force Academy. Uh, and I will tell you quite candidly that in my 35 years as an intel officer, I essentially did one thing. I counted ships, planes, tanks, and missiles. I tried to figure out where they were, and I tried to figure out whether they were any good. Those are easy questions. Those are linear problem sets. and, and uh, those are grossly inadequate to the kinds of problem sets that we're dealing with today. And later in the discussion, uh, we can perhaps uh, get to that. So what I'm saying is uh, we need both more clarity from our civilian policymakers with regard to the effects they hope to achieve in places like Syria. And we as a military must expand our horizons to look beyond traditional military instruments of power. Needless to say, there's a new domain that has emerged that we will probably get to later in this conversation called cyber, which is a game changer as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not sure that the traditional lens we as a military bring to the challenge of a security predicament encompasses that new domain. That's just one example. There are also non-kinetic Nonviolent, if you will, measures emerging from the traditional domains of air, land, sea, and space. I'm not sure that we have a sufficient appreciation of those non, those nonviolent, if you will, uh, tools. Yeah, I, I would just add to, to your question. You asked if if we fear being sent uh, into that kind of an environment. I think what Dr. Rocky just said about. Uh, wanting clarity, that is absolutely the case. But I, I think fear is not exactly the right word to use with this profession because the nature of the profession is uh, if you look at our oath, if you look at the commissions that some of us have and, and some of you will get, uh, it, it, it doesn't really talk much about fear. It talks a lot about supporting and defending against all enemies, foreign and domestic, bearing true faith and allegiance to the same, it talks about uh, diverse responsibilities that, that we have, one of which is to have that dialogue so as to shape the effect that we're being asked to create. Um, and uh, I, I just, without, without diming him out completely, my boss at the Air Force Personnel Center during his tenure there, the center redesigned its patch. Uh, and it's still the patch today. It has, standing on the globe, an airman saluting. Uh, the airman did not have a, a, a dream sheet in his or her hand. Uh, the airman was saluting. And so to a certain extent, it, it's sort of irrelevant. It, it is important, but it's not relevant to our employment as a profession because we're instrumental. But part of our instrumentality is asking really hard questions and being very upfront about what we can and can't do 
and how well we can and can't do the things we're being asked to do. So if we need to ask <clears throat> those hard questions as military leadership, what questions should we be asking to the civilian authorities before we go into combat? Two-hander. Yes, sir. Uh, your statement that the American people would support, I think, kind of overlooks the fact that we already have American men and women flying combat missions on a multi-daily missions over there. Uh, throughout that region, we've got rescue forces in place, we've got special forces in place, we've got MUSE over there. We have assets over there already, already engaged in many different uh, areas, and I might add that many of those men and women flying those missions are graduates of this very school. So we are already engaged. Very decisively, I don't know, but we are engaged. I, I would love to follow up on that if I could. <clears throat> the, uh, the point we've been making about dialogue between civilian and military leaders is borne out by that because it, I bet if we did a show of hands in this room, most news channels carry this discussion as air power is not enough, it takes ground troops. That is a caricature of the kinds of issues that we're dealing with and it, it overlooks the fact that, that we do have people engaged it also overlooks the fact that ground troops are not a panacea, uh, no matter how many of them you have, which goes back to how do, we, how do we define the desired effect and the question that we need to ask going into uh, any engagement, it, it's not so much the end state that used to be the, the, the term you'd hear, but what, what effects would you like your military instrument to create as we work through what's certainly going to be an extended problem set uh, and, and down to a, a pretty specific level or, or it's hard for us to do whatever that is. There's a two-hander by the cadet in the back first. Uh, Edward Kalsalde, uh, General Rocky, you mentioned uh, it's not about ships, tanks, and planes necessarily anymore. They brought up the topic of cyber. I was just wondering, what do you think about uh, anonymous basically taking the fight against ISIS over cyber and should we support them or should we kind of neglect them as a... Yeah. One of the problems that comes with age is this, Gary. Uh, uh, what was your, just repeat the, the question. So what do you, what do you think about uh, anonymous uh, targeting ISIS over the cyber front and basically being a vigilante force against ISIS over cyber? I'm, I don't have sufficient expertise about anonymous uh, to, to answer, uh, answer that question. What I would say in a more general sense uh, is that there is a cyber war underway as we sit in this room. And we're not, we're not competing in that cyber war as effectively as I would like. Uh, and one way or another, we have to come to grips with that because most of the players out there are smart enough to realize they can't whip us, so to speak, in the traditional domains. We can handle those easily. Uh, but the cyber domain, a man-made domain, not, not a natural domain, has an entirely different logic uh, behind it. Uh, your, uh, the word anonymous is interesting because the hard reality is we're not going to know for sure, who launches a cyber attack uh, against us. Uh, anyone with any skill out there at all can go through about eight different countries uh, en route to us. Uh, it may well be, in fact, that we have to change our whole concept of deterrence when it comes to cyber. Are we willing to nuke someone who takes out Sony? Probably not. It, uh, it violates all the rules, rules of just war theory and so on, which incidentally raises another interesting question. Can you apply just war theory as we've used it in the traditional domains to the cyber domain? I have reservations about that. That's another area I think we have to think through. But the point I'm driving at is that the best deterrent, if you will, against a cyber attack may not be what we threaten our opponent. And incidentally, that's what we've done for the last 50 years, at least the last 50 years I'm familiar with. Uh, because we're not going to know for sure who the opponent is. The best deterrent 
in the cyber domain may be what we do to ourselves in terms of developing resiliency uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, my, my point is very simple. The cyber domain brings an entirely new paradigm, an entirely new challenge, and we haven't, in my judgment, thought our way through either understanding that paradigm or coming up with an, an adequate deterrent uh, to protect our interests. Thank you. Colonel Wells. My, my, my question is, is sort of a result of the conversation in your, your comments, uh, General Rocky. Uh, it's a little bit dangerous for me to, to quote Bernard Brody, but one of the things in that book that he talked about was uh, a failure on the part of military officers to, to grapple with strategy as the complexities of the Air Force and the Armed Forces, the, the demands of technology, uh, cyber, and all of these things get more and more complicated. It drives officers down to the tactical operational level just to solve the complexities of their own job. You mentioned your uncertainty about Syria. Brody would suggest that we stepped away from strategy formulation. It's just far easier for us to move count beans, bullets, tanks, airplanes, or move vast amounts of uh, supplies, munitions, and logistics support to the desert, fight the war at the tactical and operational level, and not, not wonder or even uh, be deeply engaged with what the overall effect, you said, is, without attacking the, the contribution, the skill, the bravery of Americans for the last 15 years. Neither one of these wars has resulted in what any of that great generation might regard as victory is, I guess my question is, is Brody right? Are, are, are we driving ourselves just because of this fixation with technology and the daily complexities of our job away from strategy and policy formulation as military men? My answer to that is, I think there is a danger that we are doing, that we have done that, that we are doing that. Uh, you know, it, I think, I think, for example, uh, there's something a bit odd about <coughs> presidents, presidential wannabes, uh, et cetera, uh, talking about n number of sorties you fly each day uh, over, over Syria, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, those are down in the area you're talking about. Majors and colonels can handle those kinds of issues if you have a crisp, clear definition of the effect you wish to achieve. That is, is what we're lacking, but I also must say, in defense of our senior civilian policymakers, that is an enormously complicated, complex issue. That's the hardest question. I spent, as, as was pointed out, time in the Soviet Union, uh, in, in the late 80s, uh, as the defense attaché, I was being paid, modestly, <laughs> to keep Washington informed about what was going on in the Soviet Union, particularly as it related to the military. I never once sent a cable back which said, this is a house of cards about to collapse. <coughs> I sent back a lot of good reports, and I got A's for those reports, on ships, planes, tanks, and missiles. But those were the easy, <coughs> the linear questions. <coughs> what, what you put your finger on is the really hard challenge of coming to grips with the question, what is the desired effect? We've done it, incidentally. Uh, uh, Kennan's uh, work with regard to uh, containment. You know, there's a big difference between degrading and destroying. And, if, you, and if, the, if, the, if the desired effect is to degrade and destroy, we have a real challenge on the military side coming up with a force structure, because the force structure required to degrade probably doesn't even resemble the force structure required to, uh, to destroy. George Kennan and others answered that question with some clarity, with their notion of containment. You know, my generation was a Cold War generation. We used that, that 
relatively crisp guidance, if you will, to, to structure our forces and to create strategies for those forces throughout the entire Cold War. Uh, so it is possible to come up with the kind of delineation regarding desired effect that I'm calling for. We've done it. What I'm suggesting is that if you look at this new emerging arena, you have a hard time finding that same clarity. If, if I could just just add real quick, there's in addition to sort of the the, the purposeful decision making, responding to a given situation, I think there's also a structural uh, challenge. Just as, as you say, cyber is a great example. Um, as a nation, probably as a planet, but certainly as a nation, there are seams between Cybercom and Stratcom, Cybercom and the services, Cybercom and DHS, states, private industry. The structural decisions that need to be made to create a framework in which you can have a really effective discussion about who's going to create which effect for whom when. Uh, those are really hard decisions. They're ones that are inherently political in, in, in the you know, lowercase p sense of the word. Not partisan political, but they involve resources. And so that's another boundary that militaries 20, 25 years ago really didn't have to worry about. And yet it's a, it's a really important boundary that affects how we do war fighting f f as far as we can see. There's two more two-handers, and then we'll move on here and then here. Captain Morgan, Peterson. Um, my question is in regards to, even if we get the desired um, effects defined, um, and then to your point, sir, about our fear, um, I've talked to a number of folks who've been in Afghanistan, been in Iraq, who do fear going back because they're afraid they're not going to be allowed to do their jobs because of un or really <coughs> the car leads. So, talked about the communication between the military members and senior policy members. Do you see that hurdle being able to be overcome or allowed to do our jobs to achieve desired effects going forward? Um, I, I think that is always a difficult issue. I think it has been forever. I think it's even, even more difficult now because the warfare environment is more complex with more threat vectors, much more scrutiny. Um, and I was a history major when I was here, and, and when I hear people on the news talk about a catastrophic airstrike involving single-digit numbers of casualties, I mean, we, we all get it. Human beings are, are inherently important. Everybody's a child, parent, you know, so, so it's, it's not that we should ever trivialize those kinds of things or ever take less than absolutely seriously are we that make it harder for us to protect ourselves in that kind of a situation. But in historical context, you know, a, a tragedy is when you have uh, a Dresden or a, a Stalingrad or things like that. So, so the, the scrutiny that our individual military members get placed under, the things that we have to do in order to execute what used to be uh, individual decision making sometimes now gets aggregated up to literally a national level because we can, because we have the comm links that enable decision makers in Washington to decide on a particular action uh, on the other side of the world. I, when I was in Afghanistan, I felt exactly that way about what people were doing uh, that, that I was responsible for and that I was partnering with. Uh, the ROE are never as useful as we want them to be, but, but there is a fine balance. So I think, again, it's an example of where the dialogue has to go all the way from the folks at the point of application through their leaders. You have to have the discussion at, at the, at the decision-making level with all the facts on the table, and then you just sometimes get a decision that you don't like. And I think we've seen that in the implementation of counterinsurgency strategy. Which, which shifted risk onto our forces um, at some tactical success uh, over time, but probably higher casualties. So it's, it's, a, tough, it's a tough issue. I mean, I, 
I respect it. I think you're exactly right. People, people do have inherent human fear about having their hands tied, not being able to either do their job or increasing their risk of not coming back. Major Lewis Sacker from the DF Special Ops Wing, I'm going to occur on. I think the question about boots on the ground, and then the uh, cadet's question about cyber, and then the question about are we, is, is fundamentally rooted in our failure to fully understand our enemy. So we, we look at everything through a, a lens as a Westerner, and we assume then that the enemy, in particular ISIS, falls into the same kind of Western mindset of the Westphalian state where they're looking to achieve set borders, achieve some kind of objective that we would relate to as Westerners, and that's not the case. So they view themselves as an agent of a forthcoming apocalypse. So for them, the culmination of their efforts is going to be a, an apocalyptic battle outside of Dabiq, Syria, in which only about 5,000 of them remain alive. So, and a caliphate is borderless, basically by its definition, should always be expanding with jihad rage to wage once a year by the caliph. So, by, and that battle at side of Dabiq is supposed to be waged against Roman, against Rome, right? Which they supplant Western culture for that, for the United States in particular. So when we say, I'm gonna put boots on the ground or air power isn't enough, it totally belies a complete misunderstanding of the nature of our enemy. <coughs> so if we do put boots on the ground in the traditional conventional sense like we tried and successfully to do in Afghanistan, then we play right into their goals and it becomes a recruiting tool for them. And myself and a number of the other guys who are here from our wing have spent a lot of time in Afghanistan and see how uh, the desire to push conventional forces onto an enemy or an adversary of which we have very little understanding and a culture we have very little understanding only results in what we've seen in Afghanistan. And that is part of the reason that the ROE is so restrictive is because we've tried to go into a culture and force it into a Western model of government and nation state. And culturally and developmentally, that's, that's not where they are. And we looks like we may try and do that against ISIS. We're gonna put a bunch of boots on the ground, we're gonna take back the territory that doesn't ultimately address the nature of the problem. So for you guys who are cadets, as officers, you're gonna be expected to be technical experts, but ultimately your your real role is understanding the enemy so you can adjust whatever technical capability or tactics you have to address and kill them or, or address that that critical vulnerability of theirs. We do a terrible job of that. Okay, I'd like to respond to that. Uh, words matter a lot and everybody tends to think of General Petraeus and, and the coin strategy as being highly successful because it, it was in one respect but I would argue it's not a strategy, it's a tactic. And your point about understanding the enemy is huge. And there's also precedent for the kind of battle you're talking about. It's, and it's one that uh, some, of, well, a fair number of people in this room are old enough to remember. But when I was a, a, a brand new B-1 crew member, my, that airplane at that time couldn't even carry a conventional bomb. So we stood alert at McConnell knowing that we were almost certain not to do anything with our airplanes that would hurt somebody other than ourselves uh, if we weren't careful. But that if we did go to war, it was existential. It was the big deal. And there was a certain vernacular about that. There was a certain understanding of it. And my, my question to, to all of us would be, you know, it was easy to recognize then. How do you recognize it in the kinds of conflicts that we deal with now? And I think that's important, and I appreciate your comment. You know, I, I just add that uh, what, what you articulated very well is, I believe, pure Sun Tzu. Uh, what, what has happened, whether we like it or not, is the battlefield has expanded from land, sea, air, even space. 
it, it now includes the heads of both ourselves and our opponents. And, and what you're calling for, quite correctly, I believe, <coughs> is getting in the head of our opponent in such a fashion that the opponents have a view of the security predicament which is consistent with our own. That's a new, that's a new game in town, uh, even though Sun Tzu talked about it a, a, a long time ago. And it's a game for which uh, places like the Air Force Academy uh, have a responsibility <coughs> to prepare, uh, prepare their graduates. But what a challenge. That's really tough. This has um, been a really interesting line of questioning. And I think that was a two. A two hander? Okay. Yes, sir. One more two hander. Uh, it's said that in, you know, if you don't read history and understand it, that's going to repeat it. And, uh, and I'm seeing some parallels now between the relationship between the senior civilian leadership and the military as we had towards the end of Vietnam even to the point where we've got senior civilian leadership calling the uh, battlefield tactical guys and talking to them on the phone. And that shows me a basic lack of trust from the senior leadership towards the military. How do we solve that? How do we as a military get that trust back from the leadership in Washington? Very carefully. I mean, I was... <laughs> I, I, I was an intelligence officer during Vietnam. I, every morning I waited for what we called JCS targets. That was a list of targets that we were authorized to strike that would be updated essentially on a daily basis and okay. came essentially from the it basement of the, the White House. Uh, and and uh, the, uh, the, the, the question that we had earlier, uh, I think actually uh, raised the same point you've raised. Uh, we, need to, we need to figure out how to keep our senior policymakers focused on the issues for which they are responsible. And they are the hardest issues. Uh, and if we are unsuccessful in that, what you will find is a lot of uh, multi-thousand mile screwdrivers from Washington making tactical level uh, decisions. General Lawrence? Uh, a thought, and this is where your technology comes in. Uh, it was awfully hard for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. He had came up with a strategy and to implement in the Pacific or in Europe. Uh, I'm a firm believer that people do things because they can. And so the young cadets here who are going to fight the future wars, they're going to have to learn to live in this environment, whether they want to or not. For instance, a, uh, a drone, an RPA, has everybody loves video feed, and they like to watch that one tank, and they frame it, and they drop a bomb on it. And if you watch all the senior leaders in the room, they're watching the bomb as it hits the tank and it explodes. And it literally sucks them from the strategic level down to the tactical level. If you see the old picture on the Osama bin Laden attack, and there's the president and the staff watching it live and in color. And that drags them all down to the tactical level. Doesn't mean they should be there, it just does. It's human nature, social media. In the, as to allude to these two gentlemen, as time goes on, you are going to have to learn, whether you want to or not, to fight in that environment. Because I believe it will happen more, not because you want it to, but because technology will drive it to where you want it because they like to see it live and in color, and especially if their political futures or the future of the nation is there, they want to have hands on. Just a thought. If I could just add one last thing, I know we need to move on. <laughs> um, one of the things I think for, for you cadets who are entering this world, General Renz is exactly right, the technology exists. Part of being a leader is making not choices between good and bad, between, but between good and not so good. Uh, I, I actually am fairly proud of helping some smart people kill a project that would have finally let the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, quote, drill down and find out if Airman Snuffy at Base X is current in 9 millimeter, current in, in physical uh, fitness testing, etc. 
why would we ever want to do that? That's what NCOs are for. That's what lieutenants are for. That's what commanders are for. So sometimes the smart choice is doing exactly what General Lorenz was, was intimating, which is keeping the decision and the information at the right level so that people can focus where their competencies are. Uh, and, and just because you can and just because it's cool is not a great reason to, to do something. Yeah, I want to move on now, so I'll come back to those of you. We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end. Um, I'm already skipping some of my questions, by the way, <laughs> because of time. Um, I'd like to drill down a little bit and kind of move our level of analysis down to apply specifically to the Air Force. There are some who claim the Air Force has long faced an identity crisis. Because we are a service that tends to identify more with airframes than an overall strategic purpose, we have become irrelevant as a service in the minds of some, particularly in our sister, sister services. As an example, at its beginning, the Air Force had a clear purpose. Unique to air power, strategic attack executed with bombers. Uh, General Miller talked about how that evolved into nuclear deterrence, as he said, nuclear alert. As the Cold War began, bomber pilots literally ruled the Air Force. Missiles soon augmented the bombers as a second Air Force controlled leg of the nuclear triad. But over time, along came Vietnam, the end of the Cold War, and other regional wars. And in the meantime, the Air Force neglected to upgrade its Minuteman deterrent or buy a sufficient number of B-2 bombers. You only had one base, General. Um, to replace the aging B-52s, a sign that that original strategic mission was no longer relevant. Is there relevance to this claim? Why or why not? <laughs> uh, I think there's relevance to the claim. There is no truth to it, however. Uh, this, we could talk about this all, all day. Deterrence is inherently difficult because you can't, you can't prove a negative very easily. Um, we, had, we had X number of bombers, 700 plus B-52s. We had 1,400 B-47s back, back in the heyday, uh, all the way down to 20 B-2s. Every single bomber that we have owned for the last four decades has been used a lot. B-52s flew 100 and, I think 140,000, or either 140 or 175,000 sorties in Vietnam. 33% uh, of the ordnance that was delivered in, in uh, the Allied force at the end of the 90s was dropped by 3% of the sorties, B-2s. Uh, the first bombs that, that fell in Afghanistan and in Iraq both, uh, both times came from bombers as well as some other aircraft in, in Iraq. So whether it's the relevance of that mission to what we actually do or it's C-17s delivering humanitarian assistance uh, by, by parachute or, you know, uh, you name it. The, the Air Force is an absolutely essential enabler and that's one of the things that I think we as a service have kind of wrestled with because it's easy to focus on the stuff that's highly visible. You know, when you have uh, a thousand F-16s and 700 F-15s and they, they bring huge combat power to any fight, it's very easy to get excited about that and, and to point to it. But what the other services uh, sometimes don't really want to recognize is that every single thing they do is absolutely dependent on what the Air Force brings to the fight. And so um, I, I, that's a long way of saying I think we are still incredibly relevant, but just like the wireless signals that are running through this room, uh, just like your electricity at home or in the dorm, uh, you don't always walk in and say, hey, thanks, light switch. Uh, it, it just works. Uh, I'll, I'll take 15 seconds for, for a great analogy. Talking to some grad students in, in D.C., these are some uh, Ph.D. and master's degree candidates, very smart people. I asked them, how many of you ever been in the Air Force? Zero. How many of you have family members in the Air Force? One or two. How many of you have daily contact with the U.S. Air Force? Nobody. How many of you have an iPhone or, a, uh, or an Android phone? Ah, okay. So everybody who just raised your hand has daily contact with a signal that your Air Force provides 
via a constellation of 24 satellites above this planet, which, by the way, is neither easy, cheap, or simple to, uh, to make happen. So long way of saying, yeah, we're, we're still highly relevant. But one of the things that we as airmen have to balance is you know, beating our chest and being at the tip of the spear versus being an essential part of the national security spear. And it's, it's always a difficult balance, but it's, uh, it's an important one. If I could just add a, a, a brief footnote. General Miller mentioned the C-17. As I reflect on Sun Tzu and our major colleague here, uh, and, the, and, the, and the reality <coughs> of the battlefield now involving what's in the heads of our opponents and ourselves, and, and cognizant of having a son who's retired from the Air Force but who flew F-16s for 17 years and probably wouldn't agree with what I'm about to say. But my point is, in this new world where what's in the heads of your opponent is really important, it may be that that C-17 carrying relief supplies into Haiti has as much of an impact on our security predicament as my son's F-16 loaded to the gills because of what it says about who we are as a nation, about what we are as a nation. That, the answer to what we are as a nation, I think is very important to what Sun Tzu and our major colleague uh, pointed out, and from that broader perspective, it makes the Air Force role even, I would argue, more substantial. The United States Army couldn't do the Berlin Airlift. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the Berlin Airlift, in very graphic way, uh, was a narrative about who we are as Americans. And, and it was a very a valuable resource. I've heard over the years so many naval officers, marine officers, army officers, chide us Air Force guys, all you want to do is shoot down MiGs. There's a lot of truth to that. <laughs> I say to them though, you know, if we're shooting down those MiGs, they're not bombing you, okay? Air superiority is not an American birthright. In the rule book of rules, we don't have a chip that says we always get to control the third dimension. We gotta go out and earn that. We gotta make that happen. And when we do, that's not necessarily gonna win that war, but it's certainly gonna enable our surface forces to then go in and do what they've got to do without having to constantly worry about being bombarded from the air. Just watch what's going on in Ukraine right now and see how they're fighting there. The, the Soviet, not the Soviets, I'm dating myself. The Russians are using their air defenses to control the airspace over Ukraine so the Ukrainians cannot use their air force to help protect their country. And they're losing, they're losing big time. It's not a birthright. There's a two-hander in the back. I guess I can talk about it. Um, sir, I would like to ask a question about, you know, how the Navy said we are having to expand our horizons of warfare into the minds of our enemies and ourselves. But I wonder if possibly expanding that horizon also to not only our civilian population who supports us and also our assistance services might help us in both, you know, them realizing that we are a very important role, not just, you know, show of force, um, and also help maybe us understand and uh, be able to apply that crisp uh, leadership, I'm sorry, the crisp uh, direction from our civilian leadership that you were asking for earlier. Jim Rocky and I are both old enough to remember the days before Goldwater Nichols. So by, by perspective, we are so much further ahead of where we were at the beginning of our, our you know, first three decades, four decades of our, of our Air Force. Um, I, how, how many of you have deployed with other services? Okay, if you've done that, you know that when you're out doing it, you are an American. And the, the service rivalries, th there are differences in service cultures that make us have to be conscious about how we talk to each other. Uh, you know, the, the famous example of what each of the services mean when they talk about securing something. But, but in terms of intent and, and squabbling, that doesn't happen. Where I think it's important is, again, forging concepts of how we're going to operate to achieve those kinds of civilian objectives that we can, and then 
and then at the senior levels, trying to make the right choices for the nation about who possesses which capabilities and, and how we're going to organize, train, and equip to be prepared to deploy and, and operate together. Um, it, it's, it's not simple. I'm, I'm not really answering your question very well other than to say it is really important and the more that, that we can articulate what we do and what we need and do it in a way that is, is collaborative and team building with our sister services, not uh, competitive except where we need to be, uh, then, then we'll all benefit from that. And that's something you got to pick up from, from day one because it's, it's habits of thought, habits of discussion. And by the time you get to, uh, you know, 06 and above, if you don't have that mindset that you're going to work with your sisters and brothers and other services to get it done, uh, you're not going to develop it then. Another two hands. Sir, uh, Captain Nolting, also from the Fox, Wooden and Kirtland, we're a combat rescue pilots by trade and crew. Um, it's kind of irrelevant to, I guess, my comment. Thinking about what everybody's been talking about um, and what Major Losacker brought up as far as understanding your enemy, we talk about our the strategic goal of the Air Force or our purpose statement, mission statement, if it's uh, the ability to provide humanitarian aid or airlift, strategic strike with target weapons, precise weapons. Um, we have a bombardment from World War II as our history. And if, if we think about the, the Haiti airlift stuff, well, they'll think about us and they'll think about America and what we stand for. But what if we understand our enemy and it just turns out that they're, in effect, nihilists? Well, what do you do? They don't care. Right. Well, you know what I mean? He, so he did a Marine exchange. <laughs> and he would say, you just have to kill them. And if we do that, how do we do that? How do you do that humanely? Yeah. How do you, it's an insane thing to even say that, right? I mean, what do you do? You can't go to Brock at Syria and politely kill ISIS without killing everybody else that lives there, that wants them part of it. You know? So I don't know if anybody in the room has a good solution for how to combat somebody who is totally willing to die and doesn't care about what you say at all and wants to bring you there to kill you. And I think it's a unique problem with that. And the more technology advances, the greater that threat becomes because it can hurt you that much more, either through cyber or some sort of small nuke, et cetera. Yeah. Um, and I see that as the biggest problem for the country, for you know, democracies in general. Yeah. Yeah. It's yours, Chris. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think. That is a tremendously insightful comment because I think it goes to a very difficult dynamic. You know, when I was talking about the Cold War, everybody knew that if we had that one, all bets were off. It was going to be unbelievably ugly. What you're talking about is an existential fight at a micro level while normal life just keeps on trucking. Um, and the only, uh, this is not an answer, this is a, a plea to all of us and everybody else who ever thinks about this stuff, that we have got to continue holding up that reality to the people who make decisions so that they can make the right decisions to let us do what needs to be done. Uh, because it is, it, it is a very different kind of enemy, as, as you guys know firsthand. You, you gentlemen have, have spoken well about the need to educate those on the Hill and those in the White House about the decisions that they should make for the good of the service. However, what I'm hearing from the Hill is that the military has become militant in their lobbying. Uh, the, the, behind closed doors, there's, there's a huge amount of criticism of the White House. There's a huge amount of criticism of the budget. At what point do you have to start metering that before you damage the relationship? I think I used the word carefully earlier in this conversation. Uh, you raised an important point. I don't, I, I don't know whether what you've described represents truth. I have no access to that uh, information. Uh, but we do have a responsibility, it seems to me, as a military, to make clear what is required for our 
tools to work effectively. That can be done, I would argue, in a way that is consistent with, with uh, our Constitution, with, with civility, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It's difficult when the climate is so politicized that even the time of day has a political dimension. But, but I, I think what General Miller has already pointed out is that we have to keep working at that uh, in a very, in a in a very careful, uh, in a very careful way, and hope for the best. Uh, our our senior policymakers are smart people, uh, and it seems to me that what we're calling for is a reasonable request, and as an optimist, uh, I would say sooner or later we'll get that sorted out, if it isn't sorted out now. I think part of the problem, though, you, you know, it goes back to what you talked about, the strategy. You know, Harry Summers, for all of us who are a little bit older, Harry Summers in the 70s and 80s reminded me of how we failed in Vietnam, because we didn't have an objective. And General Rocky, that's what you were talking about. But I would say your question relative to the strategy of, uh, of what uh, the White House or the administration comes up with, part of the problem is a lot of the information that we have is we don't have an integrated way of doing a cross-agency process. It's disintegrated. And part of the problem with that is, is that so much of it is compartmentalized right now. In other words, on the cyber side, compartments rule at least on the offensive side, not as much on the defensive side. But there's another area, you know, I, I, I by the way, uh, thank you for your service, uh, especially in the uh, special ops portion in an ISIL, but to be frank, how do you know that if you knew what was happening at LEO and GEO, how do you know that you might be far more concerned with that than what's happening with ISIL? In other words, I think you're, by the way, I agree with your idea. How do you handle nihilists? The only way is just to kill them all. But the point is, is from a national standpoint, from a strategy standpoint, when's the last time that we had a strategy where we could really look? Instead of responding to the daily news cycles, when was the time that we really said, okay, these are the objectives, and unfortunately, here's what the priorities that we have. And I don't know what the answer is, and actually some of you are leading those answers right now. But again, if you don't know what's happening at 24th Air Force, if NSA and the Air Force don't have unity of command, if other organizations in the intelligence community and the JSPOC don't have unity of command, it's very difficult to figure out some of those things. So I. I I just think I, I, I'm intrigued by the idea that you know I see every day uh, discussion on ISIL, but I how do you know that there isn't something that's far more concerning at Leo or Geo? Go ahead. Well, sir, I think an example of what you're talking about is the Quadrennial Defense Review. Quadrennial Defense Review is a thing the Department of Defense puts out every four years or so, and it focuses on one tool, the military instrument. If we're serious about what we've just heard, we ought to be, every four years or so, putting out a comprehensive, a holistic perspective on the defense predicament, or on the security predicament, which incorporates not only ships, planes, tanks, missiles, and even a little bit of cyber now, maybe, but in, incorporates the what we call dimes, uh, the uh, uh, the defense, the economic, the military, the the diplomatic, the social, etc. Uh, instruments. Uh, we don't do that. At least I haven't seen a comprehensive document that puts all all the uh, the tools, if you will, uh, into a, a single document, along with the various nature, the various aspects of the threat, and we need to do that. But it will be hard because of. I mean, Dr. Snyder told us yesterday, in a very articulate fashion, there that we 
we have both a profession and a bureaucracy. We're stuck with them both, unfortunately. And, and there are things that go on in the bureaucracy that make it difficult for us to be the kind of professionals we would like to be. But the struggle must continue. We can't give up. Yeah, if, I, if I could just add to your point, the, pull this chart up, because <coughs> what it shows as a percentage of what the federal government is, is spending, starting on the left, 62, projected out to 2017, and this is, this is from a couple of years ago. The gentleman is smiling. A series of administrations over decades have made decisions on that bottom layer of sand to decrease the percentage of what this nation devotes to defense. And so when I was trying to justify the Air Force's fiscal year 13 budget, um, we had done analysis that said we don't need to do the things that are in the national military strategy. We do not need about 80 some odd, see, I, and don't hold me to the number, but it was a somewhere between 75 and 100 C-130s. Uh, that was not acceptable in Congress. And so those airplanes were not allowed to be retired. We're seeing a repeat of that with the A-10. And the, the reality is there's another law also passed by our Congress called the Anti-Deficiency Act that says you can't spend money you don't have. And so, so the challenge for us, just like General Rocky said, is to articulate the case say why we need the things that we're asking for, and then to make it very clear what it is we will not be able to do if we are shaped in the way that it is Congress's absolute right to do. Um, but it's a tough, it is a tough debate. And, and, and I think, again, to go back to civil connection, making, making our elected representatives and their staff members really understand what we can and can't do is a responsibility on both sides. And, uh, and we just got to keep chipping away at it. It's, it's hard. Because we're down to about four minutes remaining, you want to let him have a two-handed? Yeah. Well, the general is telling me we need to let you have your two-handed question. <laughs> Fire away, Jack. I'll have one just to say that I'm not part of the military. I'm, uh, I love the military. Um, and I'm part of the military. And I think that <laughs> and um, the people I work with uh, really believe in you. And there are a whole lot of others out there who really believe in you. And I just think we need to continue being proactive. You need to be proactive in addition to all the uh, responsibilities you're all, they're all made up, they're laid on you to tell others what you're up to and what you're doing and to invest in you. Got to help shape that desired effect out there. In and uh, in the meantime, everybody you know, every resource you can bring to bear, we should be investing in you, and we should be investing in people like this. Um, that's what this country is going to have to get over uh, and get to. Thank you, sir. Um, we are down to about two minutes. I would like to allow each of our speakers to have about a one-minute concluding thought. But I also saw a cadet with just real burning hands up there. So ask your last question, and I'll ask them to wrap their concluding statements into their responses. My question is, how can we, as cadets, as people in the military, help the higher levels respectfully keep the higher levels of our leadership focused on the strategic level of things and help the lower levels deal with the tactical level. Um, 
Outside my door when I was director of assignments, I had a sign that said, so far as you are concerned, the best job for your career development is the one you were in. So the best way to, to keep people at higher levels focused on what they're supposed to do is honestly, and it sounds trite, but it is absolutely true, is to be really good at what you do so that they trust you to do what you do and they can do other things. Uh, it, it's, it's, it is not rocket science, even though you could go be a rocket scientist with that approach. Final shots? Final shots. Well, as, as you can all see, I'm the old gray-haired guy who is at that stage in life where he throws stuff over the transom and lets it sizzle. Uh, let me make three comments as my parting shot. The first is that as I look over the past 50 years, and unfortunately I can do that, uh, the, the single thread of continuity that describes the profession of arms as I see it is increased complexity. Everything has consistently over the last 50 years continued to get more complicated. At some point, and this is my second, my second point, at some point in time, I don't know when, the balance, if you will, the center of balance, the center of gravity, shifted from linearity to nonlinearity. It probably was before Vietnam. We certainly missed the nonlinear non aspects of Vietnam. And there were a lot of the nonlinear aspects there. But, my, but the bottom line for my second point is that we missed, we have, we have consistently fallen behind in our recognition of this increasing, comp, increasingly complicated national security uh, arena. My third point is that you might as well give up most certainly on my generation, wait for us to die. Uh, probably even on General Miller's uh, uh, generation. <laughs> what you really need is a new way of thinking. And that's going to come from you millennials. Our, the hope for the future rests in whether you millennials craft a new way, a new way of looking, if you will, at what we've been talking about in here today. The probability is it won't even resemble much of the traditional Newtonian logic that my generation used. And incidentally, just to make matters worse, you're stuck <coughs> with institutions, too many institutions that were designed by my generation for a much more simple world. You're going to have to figure out how to take care of those institutions in a respectful, professional fashion so they don't stand in your way of implementing the new way of thinking I'm saying must come from you. My parting shot. And I would just say I'm in violent agreement with everything Dr. Rocky said in terms of linearity to nonlinearity and the challenge that you're facing. Um, I'd also underline that I think one of the things that makes being a member of the profession of arms really difficult but unbelievably important is that we work with the world as it is and try to make it the world we, we need it to be, want it to be. And so the idea that you're committed to that, that you are supportive of that, uh, means you're part of a, of a tradition of problem solvers. Not always perfect, but always essential. Uh, and and to, because I am a history major at heart, uh, a lot of things have changed, but I, I just want to read you something real quick. The war in which we'll be engaged for years to come places burdens unprecedented on their complexity and consequence upon our government. Ways must be found to increase the competence of government personnel at all levels. Administratively, our government must make improvements in the process of decision making. I'm sure I do not have to prove to this board that political as well as physical survival may well turn on the speed and efficiency with which technology is converted into weapons and weapon systems. 
nor need I argue that the war in which we're engaged is no longer, and perhaps not even predominantly, one of material and men. It's a war in which the economic and political factors have assumed crucial importance, in fact, may become the decisive factors. Those words were, uh, were spoken of the Rand Corporation uh, the year after I was born. So some things don't change. The problems are still hard. The solutions will be different, uh, but, but they're still important. And I think the, the blessing of being a member of the profession is that we get to chew away at them uh, in a way that matters. Well, we certainly thank each of you for your participation, and let's give our panel a round.